Hello, uh, my name is Raja Raman. I'm a theoretical physicist. And I'm here to tell you in this episode some things about the basics of nuclear things, reactors, weapons, and so on. So when I uh, can imagine you saying, oh God, not another physics lecture. Not, uh, we thought we're done with that in school already. Do I have to listen to it again? Well, uh, I'll try to make it uh, as painless as possible. Uh, we will talk some science, but it won't be heavy. And there'll be no formulae, there'll be no equations, and technicalities will be limited to a need to know basis. So very little will be done. But why am I inflicting this on you? That's because for the last two decades, especially in India, major nuclear happenings have been going on uh, with very serious consequences on two important fronts. One is our energy production, and the other is our national security and foreign policy. So as a result, the nuclear issues are no longer concern of just nuclear scientists or of other scientists, but also a larger segment of the polity, the politicians, bureaucrats, uh, technical personnel, media people, and generally any member of the intelligentsia by now should know something about what is behind all these nuclear happenings. So that's our topic. Uh, now, all the developments and all the talk that you see on nuclear related issue comes from two technological inventions, if you like, of the last century. One is that of the nuclear reactor, the other is that of the nuclear weapon. And whether you approve of nuclear weapons or not, or whether you approve of nuclear energy or not, either way, an educated view of their pros and cons will be greatly facilitated by some rudimentary understanding of what, how they function and what is the underlying science. And although the nuclear reactor and the bomb are produced for vastly different purposes, one is, you know, purpose is different, the appearance is different, the size is different, but they follow from essentially the same underlying phenomenon. That's the phenomenon of nuclear fission. So my first task is to explain to you what nuclear fission is. Now, <clears throat> high school chemistry tells us, let's, let me begin this from the beginning. Uh, going back to school, we learn actually in chemistry, not in physics, that all matter around us in its infinite variety, there are butterflies, horses, people, living, non-living, they are all made up of only about 100 different elements. Everything is made up of these 100 different elements. We have millions and billions of different things in the universe. They're all made of 100 elements. We read about them in chemistry. There's a table in which they are put called the periodic table. Copper, iron, they're all elements. But it's quite impressive already what the chemists had managed to do that they deduce the multiple, the billions of diverse looking objects as something's made up of only 100 different basic unit. So now if you take any element and break it into smaller and smaller pieces, take a chunk of iron, cut it into half, you get two chunks of iron, cut it more, cut it more. The smallest piece you'll get to, which is still iron, is called its atom. This was already discovered in the last century, by again by the chemists. So a chunk of iron is made up of identical iron atoms, one after another after another, strung together in a certain way. Same thing is true for anything else. Same thing is true of gold. Same thing is true of oxygen. Same thing is true of nitrogen. Take a gas of nitrogen, it's filled with nitrogen atoms. So every element, its basic unit is an atom. And there are atoms for every element, iron atom, gold atom, and so on. Now, elements have widely different properties. A chunk of iron is very different and cost much less than a chunk of gold. Both are very different from chlorine. Both are very different from oxygen. These are different elements. They are all widely different in their properties. Nevertheless, the basic atoms with which they are made are very, very similar to one another. That's another amazing discovery. All atoms have the same structure. Now, what is that structure? An atom consists of the following components. It has got electrons which are going round and round in circles around a central nucleus. Uh, the atom is very small. If you think of, it's, it's supposed to be 10 to the minus 8 centimeters. That doesn't mean anything to anybody by itself. But if you think of the atom as the size of your thumb, thumbnail here, then if you thought of uh, the entire room here as stretched to the size of, say, India, then the thumb atom would look like the size of a room. So it's like having a room in, inside 
a whole country, that's the relative proportion of an atom to just a centimeter. But those are sizes. Primarily, I want you to understand that it is small, very, very, very small. Furthermore, inside the atom, what the atom consists of, electrons going round and round, like planets do, around a nucleus, which is in the middle, just like the sun is. The nucleus is again tiny compared to the atom. Atom is tiny enough, nucleus is even smaller. And the nucleus in turn is made up of two things called neutrons and protons. That's about all the stuff you've got to memorize. There is the atom. Inside that, way up inside, even smaller, if the atom was the size of this room, the nucleus is the size of a pinhead. Roughly what happens also in the solar system. If you take the solar system, sun is a very small, tiny pin in the middle, and the planets go around. Just in the same way, there's a nucleus in the center of every atom, and the electrons go around it. Now, what's the difference between an atom of oxygen, atom of nitrogen, atom of sodium, atom of iron? They all have a nucleus in the center. They all have electrons going around. The only difference is in the numbers. Depending on how many electrons you have, how many neutrons and protons you have in the nucleus, the behavior changes. So all atoms can be understood if you understand the structure of a nucleus in the middle and electrons going around. So that is basically what the atom is. And that tiny nucleus is the hero of our story. That's what gives rise to all the energy I'm talking about. So it's really deep inside an atom, which is already very, very small. The reason I keep emphasizing the smallness is because it is so small, it took a long time for modern science to see it, let alone manipulate it and understand it. That is why for all these centuries, man never exploited nuclear energy. It was there. He didn't even know it was there, but it was there. And that's because it was so small. So it took four centuries of modern science, even modern science after Galileo and so on. It took four more centuries to look at a nucleus, to be able to understand it, see it, and then exploit it, which happened in the mid of the 20th century. So what are the things that happened? The reactor and the bomb. Incidentally, people call it the atom bomb, and they call it the Atomic Energy Agency. All these are misnomers. Uh, in, in fact, it's not an atom bomb at all. Uh, when you break an atom, what you have to do is to pull out those electrons on the outside. The atom consists of that whole solar system. So anytime you pull out an electron, you are breaking an atom. So by breaking atoms, you don't get this huge energy. What you do get some energy when you have chemical reactions, when you light a matches, matchstick, that's a chemical reaction. That what it does is it shakes up the electrons out in the outer circles of that atom. You're not doing anything to the nucleus, which is deep inside. So you break an atom when you burn gasoline, you break an atom when you light matchstick. Even when you have explosions of TNT, you're only breaking atoms, which means in an atom, you're fooling around with those electrons which are on the outside. Meanwhile, the nucleus that is in the middle is totally untouched by all this. You can have a big dhamaka, a big explosion. All the atoms are being scattered around, but every nucleus didn't even know it happened. So it's hard to reach the nucleus, hard to do anything to it because it is so small and because it's located so deep inside. So the energy that you get out of breaking an atom, as it were, fooling around with electrons, taking them out, yanking them in. Those energies are the so-called chemical energies. That's what gives you the energy when you light fire. That's what man discovered when he discovered fire. That's also the energy that you get from TNT explosions. Even the biggest explosions with uh, conventional explosives, you're not touching the nucleus at all. So it gives you a certain level of energy. It can be high, uh, or conventional explosions can be strong. But to get the much more strong, much bigger, nuclear energy, you have to go and prod that nucleus deep inside. Very hard to do because it's so tiny you can barely see it, So even with an atomic uh, microscope. And to find it located and break it is a very difficult task. That's why it has taken centuries to do that. It is when you break the nucleus, then you get a different scale of energy altogether. That's called nuclear energy. So it's nuclear energy and increasingly nowadays, People have used the word nuclear weapons, nuclear energy, but they still call it the Atomic Energy Commission because that's from way back and they don't want to change that name. So you are not breaking atoms when you get a nuclear weapon or a reactor. You are breaking the nucleus. So there's a picture I have, which I want, there it is, of, uh, of a nucleus being broken uh, and things coming out. Now, breaking a nucleus, as I said, is not easy. Uh, explosions and so on don't do it. But there are some nuclei which are already over overloaded. You know, they're barely about to survive. And if we just could just touch them, give a small prick, they will come apart on their own. 
there are a few nuclei, therefore, that are on the verge of coming apart. When you can identify these nuclei and give it a small probe, then that nucleus will break, and it will break into two big parts and a few tiny small ones. That process whereby a big nucleus breaks into two daughter nuclei, we call them, and a few more neutron particles coming out, that is called fission. Uh, and very, very few nuclei uh, out of the 92 elements we have, very few of them undergo fission. Okay. Pieces, that's called fission. And when they break into two pieces, they emit a great deal more energy than any chemical energy can give you. So you, what you do in a reactor or in a bomb is you have this nucleus sitting there with two kinds of balls in it, neutrons and protons stuck together rather like uh, any kind of sweet made of peanuts which you stick together, it's rather like that. And if you go and prod it with an external neutron, hit it, it will break into two big pieces, a couple of small neutrons and a huge amount of energy coming out. Now, it so happens we have 100 elements in the world and there are many, many varieties of each element, but most of them do not undergo this fission. We just as well, because if we had so many nuclei doing fission, our terrorists would have no problem at all getting hold of dozens of them. In fact, it is very hard to find a material uh, which undergoes fission. There are only two kinds of things which undergo fission. One is uranium, certain varieties of, and the other is plutonium, certain varieties of. The word varieties I'm using, the technical word is isotopes, but I don't want you to worry about what an isotope is. But there are uranium of different kinds. For your purpose, I can say there's uranium-238, uranium-235, and so on. These numbers denote something which need not concern us. Some of these guys, uranium-235, does break up, does undergo fission, and does give you energy if you could use it. Now, uranium that you dig from the ground in the form of ore, that consists mostly of uranium-238, which is not fissile, which is useless from the fission point of view. So most of the uranium you dig out of the ground is not useful for fission. But luckily, within that ore in the ground, natural uranium, there is less than 1%, about 0.7% of the desired isotope 235. So there are different varieties of uranium. The bulk of it in the ground is the unuseful variety, 238, and a small part of it, 235, which is useful. So it is the small fraction of 235 in the uranium under the ground that is supplying the energy for all our reactors and also our weapons. Apart from uranium, plutonium is another element which also undergoes fiction, that's fusion, uh, fission. That's for the record I just mentioned. So these are the fissile materials. Now, the point is this: each fission reaction, could, each fission reaction, gives out a certain amount of energy, but that energy cannot even light a light bulb because it's so small. The nucleus is a small thing. The nucleus, an atom itself, is a small thing. One atom or one nucleus cannot give you any substantial amount of energy. What you have to do is to get, but on the to make up for it, we do have zillions of nuclei in a chunk of matter. Now, what is zillions? I won't tell you because I don't know what it means. There is millions, there's billions, there is trillions. After that, I don't know the words. So zillions stands here for bigger than anything you can think of, 10 to the 20 or something. But you know, a chunk of matter has got a large number of atoms. Each atom is tiny, each nucleus is tiny. But if you could get all of them to talk together, you will get some noise, you will get some sound. So some way has to be found of going into those nuclei and making them all fiss together, undergo break up together, or almost together. How do you do that? It's hard enough to break one of them. How do you get all of them to break together? That is done by something called the chain reaction. These words are now entered into public, into ordinary parlance. So we use the word chain reaction for many other things. But let me explain to you what a chain reaction is. In one act of fission, you have a neutron coming out. That neutron goes and hits another nucleus, if you are lucky. It will make that undergo fission, and that will give you one more neutron. That neutron can go and hit another nucleus, which can undergo fission, which can give you one more. If you can arrange things in such a way that one neutron in the beginning gives birth to one breakup, which gives birth to another breakup, which gives birth to another breakup. And that way, you begin to have something like the growth of populations. If you have the China model, where you have one couple can have only one child, 
then the population doesn't grow. In fact, it will die out. If one couple can have two children, then the population more or less stable. If a couple can have 2.1 children, by that you mean the 20 couples will have 21 children, then the population can grow. It's the same thing here. The place of population, you think of fission processes going on. If one fission can trigger another, which can trigger two, which can trigger four, which can trigger eight, then pretty soon a lot of them are undergoing this process. That still seems to be happening one after another. Wouldn't there be a lot of blips which are by individually no good? Answer is no, because all these happen extremely fast. Things travel at the speed of light inside the nucleus. Nucleus itself is small. So for one fission to the next, to the next, to the next, all happens in one zillionth of a second. Very, very tiny portion of time. You can, for all practical purposes, think, think of it as simultaneous. So this is how you get all the nuclei in your sample, or a large fraction of them, to undergo fission together. And when they do that, then you get huge amounts of energy. So a reactor typically produces for you, say, 1,000 megawatts, a big reactor at Kudangulam. That's coming because all the U-235 nuclei in that fission rod, a large fraction of them are undergoing fission together. So the process of having a chain reaction is similar to the process of growth of population. One can have the following situation happen. With every fission event, if you have only one more fission event triggered by it, and that triggers only one more, then you can imagine the population will be stable. It's like saying a pair, set of parents will produce two, children will produce two, will produce two. In that case, the population of the country will be roughly the same. In the same way here, if the chances of one neutron producing a fission and that producing the next one, that producing the next one, is such that the generations grow only by a factor of one or roughly close to one, that is called a normal functioning steady reactor. And that is what happens in a nuclear reactor. Nuclear reactors don't die out. Nuclear reactors also don't blow up. If the multiplication factor, by that I mean the factor by which one generation's number grows compared to the previous one, if that's less than one, that's the China policy, then the population will die out. If one fission event leads to more than one, it could even be 1.1 or 1.001, then by compound interest in banks, 1.001 the first round, square of that the next round, square of that the next round. By the time you finish with all the nuclei in that little sample, you have a huge amount of energy coming. It all happens very fast, and the whole thing bl blows uncontrollably out of your hand. And that is what is a nuclear weapon. So the only difference between a bomb and a reactor is controlling the rate by which one fusion fission leads to the next, leads to the next, leads to the next. So that is why the physics is common, although the aims and the sizes are very different. So. <clears throat> What would you have in a reactor then is something which should generate steady energy for you. So you have fuel rods, which means uranium rods, just stuck there in water, which keeps it cool. And they're set at the right distance from one another so that the chance of this multiplication stays at one. So it neither blows up nor dies out. Now, you can't exactly make it one. Nothing in nature can be made exactly once. Sometimes it goes a little higher, sometimes lower. Then you have control rods in a reactor which go and stop the neutrons, some of them, and destroy them from creating more. So in a reactor, you always have these guys, these rods going in and out, not done by people, because it has to be done very fast. It's done by computers, which lower them and raise them. So in a functioning reactor, these control rods are continuously being looked at by computers. They're thrown in and out, just to keep the reaction rate such that the generations don't grow exponentially. So I've shown there a picture of the reactor. We will skip that. And uh, what about nuclear weapons? Nuclear weapons, as I said, the same as a reactor, except that it goes very, very fast. Now, how do we determine what is going to decide whether it goes fast or not? What features of the uranium decide whether you're going to have a bomb or a reactor? How do you go from the fuel for a bomb to a reactor or fuel for a reactor to a bomb? It's more or less common sense. As I said, the difference between the two is that in the case of reactors, you would want a fair slow rate, almost close to one, of one fission leading to the next to the next. In the case of a bomb, you need it to go much faster. How do you make these collisions happen faster? One way is to have more targets visible for the neutron that's trying to go. So the greater the density of the uranium in the target, the better the chances that one of the neutrons coming from a previous fission will come and start the next fission. So the multiplication rate is therefore determined by how much fission 
uranium, U-235, there is in your sample. Now, nature gives you only less than 1%. How do you make the percentage more? You can't add from the outside because there is no U-235 available elsewhere. So you do what you do when you boil, when you distill whiskey. You boil it and boil it, get the water go, leaving behind the stuff you want. In fact, that's what also is done when you separate wheat from chaff. You know, our grandmothers put it in a plate and go up and down like that. Because of differential density, the chaff goes in one way, the wheat goes in a slightly different way, and you separate them out. So that is what you do here. You take natural uranium. Only 1% is useful. The remaining 99% is not. Little by little by little, you take out the 99% U-238. What is left behind is richer and richer by virtue of the fact that the other guy has gone away. This is done in centrifuges, which are big rotating drums, about six feet high. They rotate rather fast, 500 times a second. That's much faster than any RPMs. It's RPSs we are talking about. And when you rotate something, as you know, things go on to the side. When you go in a car in a bend, you know that you tend to move outwards. People in the car are pushed sideways. Same way, when you rotate these nuclei in a cylinder, they all go towards the edges or the sides. But the heavier one goes a little bit more than the lighter one. So 238 goes a little bit farther out than the 235. You take advantage of this very small difference and try to remove the U-238s. This was what's done in centrifuges. And since this, this is a very delicate process, you can't do it just one centrifuge. You need to do it and do it and do it and do it again. So you get, let's say, 0.1% whiskey, then you do it again, get 0.2% whiskey, do it again. Uh, I tend to use this topic when I'm talking to military personnel. It sort of sells well. So uh, that's what centrifuges are, but you need tens and thousands of them. So you can't just do it in your garage. You can't do it in, uh, in a small basement somewhere. You do need large, huge buildings uh, like caverns in which these centrifuges are kept. These are the centrifuges that uh, uh, Mr. A.Q. Khan got for Pakistan, which enabled him to get enriched uranium for their bombs. The complaint of the U.S. and other countries about Iran now is that Iran was trying to do the same thing with its centrifuges, make its uranium richer and richer and richer in U-235 so that it can become a bomb. Then came the Iran deal, as you know, whereby Iran agreed to stop this process and put away its centrifuges, lock them up. Very recently, of course, President Trump has pulled out of the uh, deal, so we don't know what will happen uh, to the enrichment process there. But all those things are involved in the process of increasing the uranium. In the last picture that I show you is a picture of a bomb, the insides of the bomb. In a bomb, it's not a real bomb, it's a schematic picture. And I'm not showing you anything which is classified. You want to find the original source of this picture, look at the class 12 chemistry book, of CBSC exams. This picture is given there. So you can't do very much with it. Uh, what you do in a bomb is the following. By itself, they have uranium chunks which are about to explode, but still don't have the right density. Then they slam them on one another. When they slam them on one another, the density temporarily becomes more. It's like slamming two tennis balls in a sort of bunch up. So then the fission reaction takes place. So this is what is done in a nuclear weapon. Using explosives, you take uranium, which is just about to be critical, and slam them on one another through normal explosives, and then the whole thing goes kaboom. That's how a bomb works. In a reactor, we make sure that none of these things happen. We have to make sure the rods don't come too close to each other. We have to make sure they don't melt, because they melt, things become smaller, come nearer. Those are the safety measures you have to take in a reactor. So this is the basic science of what is going on. It's not very basic. Most of this is engineering. The basic part is just what fission is, which is to repeat the breakup of the nucleus inside an atom into two pieces. And these nuclei are present everywhere. They're present in you and me, in our thumb skin, in this table, everywhere. Just a matter of having to reach them and break them. That's all.